A French court has found Ottawa academic Hassan Diab guilty in absentia on terrorism charges related to the bombing of a Paris synagogue in 1980. Here is the moment Diab received the verdict. Don. I can't imagine like going through this over and over and over as if it's, you know, condemned by the god Zeus, you know, to roll the thing up for eternity. That's what I feel. Diab has been pursued by French authorities for 15 years. Three of those he spent in a French jail before the case against him collapsed. He was set free, but French prosecutors appealed, which led to this month's trial and today's conviction. Diab's lawyers say he was in Lebanon at the time of the 1980 attack and is a victim of mistaken identity. This was a trial in which the French investigators themselves, the investigative judges who investigated for three years while Hassan was held in a French prison, came to the court to plead that there was no valid basis for a conviction. That's how bizarre this outcome is. The, the investigators themselves came to this court and say, you cannot convict this man. The evidence shows he's innocent. I spoke with Hassan Diab shortly after he learned the verdict. Hassan Diab, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for inviting me. When, when we were speaking in the run-up to the verdict today, um, you, your supporters, were all anticipating that it would be a guilty verdict today. What was it like when you finally heard? How did you feel when you finally heard that it was a guilty verdict from France? Uh, still uh, devastating to know that they pursued that biased road, which led to the unfortunate uh, decision. It was not easy on me or on supporters and the family in general. And uh, a total disappointment of what happened, you know, of the decision, of today's decision in the French court. In, in reading uh, the reasons for the decision that some of the judges uh, gave today and spelling out to the court why they rendered a guilty verdict, they, they said that they had concluded that you were a terrorist, that you made the bomb, that you planted the bomb and that you exploded the bomb outside that Paris synagogue in 1980? Uh, actually, the people, the professional judges, Mark Erbo and uh, Richard Folzer, two investigative judges in France, did their job, you know. It took them years to investigate every single document. They read more than maybe 200, 250,000 pages. I can tell you the dossier maybe is larger. And these are the people who looked at every bit of anything, any lead, and they came up to the strong and robust conclusion and to drop all charges against me in 2018, January. Right. And because these are the professionals. Now, when you talk about non-professional people who didn't have time to prepare and to read the, all the dossier, which is, consists of 250,000 plus pages, uh, they could come to any different conclusion because they were not the professionals. That's what I can say. Right. So, so what you're calling the professional judges were the judges, the investigative judges, who were charged with investigating your case when you were first extradited to France and put in fleury Merigi prison. And they concluded there was strong evidence that you were probably in Beirut the day the bomb went off. Mm -hmm. There were no fingerprints that matched you found as part of the evidence, and the handwriting Canada relied upon um, was unreliable and has been discredited. How do you square that? from the investigating judges with the verdict handed down today by the judges today who are convinced, they say, that you are the terrorist who set off that bomb? Well, if you dismiss all the alibis, if you dismiss what the university documents say, if you dismiss every single exculpatory evidence, then you can come to any conclusion you want. It's easy. Right. All, all the, the university records and the alibis show that you were in Beirut writing exams. Absolutely. When this 
and you know, all students who didn't know each other at the time, they, the investigative judges asked them. One of them even was in the United States. Like you can't say like, oh, somebody put pressure on that person. And she said exactly what other students who were in Lebanon said. So we have this situation where the guilty verdict was entered today and you have been sentenced to life in prison in France and they have issued an international arrest warrant. Do you know what's going to happen to you next? Do you expect the RCMP to arrest you again? Mm, I have no idea. I have to ask uh, my lawyer here, Don Bain, about this because I'm not familiar with this, but uh, though I'm familiar now with the previous, uh, uh, you know, what's called investigation here and uh, extradition hearings and so on and so forth. But this one is new to me. I don't know how they are going to do it and how much time they need to before they do it and what their next step. Is it another record of the case, which is, this is what I believe they have to, the French have to submit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the previous record of the case was uh, judged by our judge here as uh, weak, our uh, Mer Robert Maranger, mm -hmm. uh, weak, incoherent, and all the things, and no prospect of conviction in a f <coughs> fair trial. And this one is even, if they present one, would be way less, uh, or, you know, it could way be weaker. even weaker than mm -hmm. The previous one. Right, so for people who, who don't know how extradition works as well as you do, the record of the case is, is the evidence that the country requesting extradition submits to the government to argue why you, for example, should be extradited to their country. And they would have to submit another one now. But this time, they'd be submitting an extradition request with a conviction, not an allegation. I, I mean, how are you afraid that that changes the dynamic for my, you? Uh, you know, to my knowledge, that. Uh, even if somebody was convicted in absentia, uh, the requesting state still needs to submit a record mm -hmm. of the case. We have two cases here in Canada, two Canadians were uh, missed or were convicted in absentia. I can't remember now their names on top of my head. And, they, and the requesting state at the time, France, had to submit another record of the case. Right with the conviction and the, you know, there's an, an, uh, something in the extradition law uh, specifies what the requirements are and so on. But, uh, you know, we, I still believe that uh, the, the French investigative judges did their job and they are the ones who discovered and unveiled everything and recently, just a few days ago, the same two judges testified in the court, in the very, this court, and they repeated and confirmed and affirmed their previous position in even a stronger way than when they did take their decision mm. to release me five years ago. And you, maintain, you, of course, you maintain your innocence. Absolutely. You are not a terrorist, they not say. Not right. at all, because they, I said this here and in France, I spent 38 months in almost solitary in fine, uh, confinement place, and they asked me over and over. Uh, and even, not just these two judges, other judges, two, uh, two or three other judges, Liberty and... Uh, and uh, detention judges uh, requested my release on bail. And all these, uh, you know, requests were rejected. Right. Each time you got to the point where you would be allowed more freedom or eventual release, there was another setback by a higher level of mm -hmm. the French judicial system. And I wonder how you sit here today. There is a guilty verdict against you, a life sentence awaiting you, and an international arrest warrant issued for you. And you're here, and as you have been throughout this whole thing since I've met you, very calm, not angry. I, I mean, how, how are you approaching this in such a serene way today? Well, you have to put yourself in this Kafkaesque world, if you want. 
and try to figure out what's going on, who's pulling the strings here and there. And it becomes like a, a game of like imagination. And I always imagine like what happened to me, like 15 years of, of abuse, character assassination, of, uh, you know, you name all these bad words and you have to, and they put you in the corner. You have no other option but to confront these people. You have to confront sometimes ghosts who say certain things, you know, like I'm talking about the intelligence reports and stuff like that, which were all proved to be wrong. Mm. And you have to confront like the fact that you live a life, but without an imaginary life, without tasting the real life. You live a life where you lose some of your family members. First, my brother, I couldn't go to his funeral in Lebanon. When you were then my father, when I was a few months before I was released uh, from Fleury Marougis in France, I couldn't go to his funeral and other family members are sick or whatever, I can't see them. And this is a life of like, you know, the, the I don't know if George Orwell would, uh, could talk any or ca could explain it better than me. And this is, the family is struggling. I don't know how to explain this to the ch little ones, 10 and eight year old uh, children. They know something is going on, but I try to protect them, keep them away. So this is a real struggle, not just on the legal front, but also on the family front and the supporters who don't believe anything uh, they hear now. And they ask me for explanations and I don't have any for this Kafkaesque situation. The, the prime minister was asked about the verdict today. And I know your supporters have asked the Canadian government to reject the notion of any future extradition requests from France. He did not say that today. He said that they will wait to see what the French authorities are going to do, but that they would be there to ensure that the rights of Canadian citizens are protected. You're a Canadian citizen. Just as a final point, what is your message to the Prime Minister and to his government who may have to deal with yet another extradition request? Well, I said it earlier, even today, that it's simple just to honour his words in June 2018 that what happened to me shouldn't have happened in the first place and shouldn't happen in the future. You know, that's the simplest and easiest and shortest thing. I can't ask for more. And this is, if you, if you believe that they're, all Canadians are Canadians, there isn't one Canadian, you know, two tier or less Canadian than others, then this is the right way. And we are waiting for the uh, government's action. Thank you very much. Ms. Diab, thank you for your time. Well, thank you a lot. Here at home, Diab and his lawyer are getting ready for another possible extradition fight. Don Bain is Hassan Diab's lawyer here in Canada, and he joins me now. Don Bain, it's good to talk to you again. Good to be here. What happens now with Hassan Diab now that France has uh, found him guilty? Well, normally there would be a request for extradition. Uh, there'll be an automatic sentence, I would think, imposed uh, by this French court. Uh, it will amount to a life sentence. Um, and there would then be uh, the formal request made of the Canadian government uh, for uh, 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 an extradition warrant to be executed and the authority to proceed in Canada with extradition proceedings. This brings and, us all the way back to November of 2008, right. in a lot of ways. When right. it all this is 15 years uh, that this has gone on and of, of injustice to this man and his family. There has been a loud call by you, by Hassan Dia, by other supporters for the federal government to reject any further extradition requests after you fought in court and exposed the weaknesses in the French case in, in, in the first go around. What do you expect the government will do next? Oh, gosh. <laughs> what do I expect the government will do? What I hope the government will do, honoring the Prime Minister's words 
both historically and again today that this government will protect Canadians and certainly should protect innocent Canadians uh, is decline a request for an authority to proceed because of the unique circumstances of this case. The, it was very hard watching this trial from afar and uh, there was nothing I could do. Mm -hmm. um, this man was not convicted based on evidence. Uh, there was rank opinion of lay people, of journalists, of so-called intelligence people that never would be allowed inside a Canadian courtroom. Um, and uh, the two investigators, the investigative judges who spent three years investigating this case and know it inside out, went to the court and urged the court not to convict, uh, saying there's no valid basis for a conviction. We've checked every aspect of this case and the man is innocent. Despite that, there's a conviction. It's a wrongful conviction. I'm hoping the Canadian government will recognize that. Certainly the Canadian judge at the extradition here was very hesitant uh, about uh, ordering committal and pointed out the weaknesses in the French case. And by the way, the sole piece of evidence on which Hassan was extradited, the, the handwriting opinion, yeah. was demolished by France itself when he got there. It, it was a weak case, to use the words of Justice Robert Moranger, who yes. wrote that into the extradition yes. decision, uh, backed up by the French investigating judges who their inquiries made it even weaker over time because they were the ones who verified what became Hassan Dieb's alibi, that he was in Beirut on the day the bombing went off. But yet there is a conviction. And I, I know his lawyers over there, and you call it a political conviction, but it's a conviction on the books when they make an extradition request. How does that change the dynamic for Hassan Diab that he's a convicted man now, not an accused man in the French It court? makes it more of an uphill climb. I, I will say this, um, and I will point it out to the government and to any Canadian court that gets seized with this matter. The court that convicted him was not a court of record. What does that mean? It means there's no transcript, no audio, no video. In Canada, if you go to court, you go to a court of record. Mm -hmm. Those are recognized courts. What we have here is a conviction of a man in absentia from a court that was not a court of record. So there's no accurate record of exactly what happened inside that court. Yeah, we, we've heard the French prosecutor has said today to reporters in Paris, and William Bourdon, who we spoke with, who is Hassan's main defense lawyer, Dr. Yes. Diaz's main defense lawyer in Paris, that there is a possibility for a second trial should Hassan Diab show up in France. So he has to show up, voice his objection, and then undergo another trial yet again? Is that your understanding? Which will mirror this. Right. I mean, uh, this will just be a replay of what they've already done and uh, the, the type of material they put before the court, as I say, is not evidence, it's opinion. So the only thing that stands between Hassan Dieb and dying in a French prison is the decision of the federal government of Canada. That's the most important factor in this. How do you think they'll proceed? I mean, they have been reluctant to weigh in on this as it goes through the process. I've requested comment after comment after comment over the years, and you can understand the reticence of a justice minister to intervene while and say something while a, <coughs> a process is unfolding. Right. What do you want them to do now? Do you want them to just say to France, this will not happen? It's not a hypothetical anymore, David. Yeah. When you were asking, it was, and I, I understand why the... Justice Minister wouldn't necessarily comment on a hypothetical. It's now a reality. Uh, and uh, I'm expecting that the Justice Minister and the Prime Minister uh, will look hard at what's gone on here. The, this has got a well-known history. It is a wrongful conviction and I'm trusting and hoping that that important decision will be made uh, after due consideration by the Justice Minister, that this won't be a rote, mm -hmm. oh, here's another request, we routinely accept these. Um, 
again, and I mentioned this the last time I was on this show, it's ironic. If France comes calling, uh, France rejected very recently a Canadian request for the extradition of a French priest accused of multiple sexual assaults of indigenous children here in Canada. France simply said no. Canada should do the same. If they don't, if this goes to another extradition hearing, and just as a final point, you represented Hassan Diab in what is described as the longest and most intensely litigated extradition hearing in the history of this country. Will you represent him again? Will you be there in court? Yes. All right, Don Bain, thank you. Thank you, David.